All right, thanks for tuning in. We're going to take a look at the Green Revolution, which happened in the mid-1900s. This presentation will help you understand how we can feed a growing population, what the Green Revolution is, methods of pest management, and the importance of pollination. Let's take a look at this graph of global food production starting in 1960. When we look at all these different varieties of foods, vegetables, fruits, grains, roots, and tubers like potatoes and other food crops, they have all increased significantly since 1960. And so in 2000 here, these values are up around 2.5, meaning we're producing 2.5 times more yield every year globally than we were in 1960. And you can see how this also traces the rise in, production, or rise in population. Population has not risen as quickly as our ability to produce food. Yet, despite that, we still have worldwide malnutrition. So some facts here, 870 million people, or about one in eight, are not getting enough food. And this is down, fortunately, down from, it's down 130 million since 1990. So there's progress been made. 90% of these malnourished people are in developing countries. One in four of the world's children are stunted, meaning that they are shorter than they otherwise would be. And one third of all deaths of children are caused by malnutrition. This comes from this website here. So nutrition, we're going to take a look at um, some terms you need to know. First is undernourishment, meaning you're getting too few calories. And this is mostly in the developing world. Here we can see a young boy that's suffering from that. And on the bottom we see a boy um, from Australia who experiences overnutrition, too many calories. There's another term that we use called malnutrition. And mal means bad. It's a lack of nutritional requirements. So you're getting food, but you're not getting the right food. And they can cause numerous diseases, mostly in the, mostly in the developing world. Some of these diseases we'll take a look at here. Quasiorker on top results from a lack of protein. The typical sign is bloating of the stomach caused by water retention. It's common to look at a child like this and think, oh, they're not starving, look at the size of their belly. But this is a biological response to not having enough protein. Marasmus is a, is a condition that results from a lack of protein and a lack of calories, and it causes a wasting of the body. So we had this green revolution in the 1950s, which addressed a lot of this malnutrition. And um, the green revolution techniques were developed in the West, a lot of them developed in the US, and then transferred to developing countries like India at the time, or places in Central America, Africa. And uh, here we see in India, how population has risen, but so has food production. And so now India is on its way to becoming the largest country in the world in a couple of decades. So the Green Revolution, how did they achieve this remarkable increase in food production? Well, they used special crop breeds, ones that are drought tolerant, requiring not as much water, salt tolerant, able to grow in soil that has experienced desert or um, that has experienced salinization, and crops that have longer growing seasons so that you can let them grow for a longer period of time, get bigger. We've also developed, oh yes, and larger plants. So I had put a picture of an ear of corn here to show that we've, we've used traditional breeding techniques to um, create corn that has large ears, and many of them, just as one example. And we've developed new chemicals to increase crop yield, pesticides, and herbicides. We think of pesticides as killing insects and herbicides as killing weeds. Weeds that would rob nutrients. There have been environmental impacts from this, however, because the intensification of agriculture causes environmental harm. There's been pollution from synthetic fertilizers, so we see this in eutrophication of waterways. There's been pollution from synthetic pesticides, and we can see that from extirpation of species, insects that will go extinct, or at least um, extirpated in a region due to the pesticide. We see water depletion from the increased irrigation. We see fossil fuels being used at a heavier rate for heavy industrial equipment. 
However, without the Green Revolution, much more land would have been converted for agriculture, destroying forest, wetlands, and other ecosystems. One typical thing of the Green Revolution is the intensified agriculture that resulted in monoculture agriculture, vast spreads of a single crop. We've seen this before. This is economically efficient, but it increases risk of catastrophic failure. You're putting all your eggs in one basket. And here we see a wheat monoculture in Washington state. And it has reduced crop diversity. If you think about the typical American supermarket now, it really contains very few number of different types of grain. Uh, our diet is mostly wheat, corn, even when we drink a soda, we're getting corn in the form of corn syrup. Um, even the bun served at a fast food, food restaurant has corn syrup in it. And of course, rice and, uh, and other, other ones, but those are the big ones. So this is kind of us now. 90% of all human food now comes from only 15 crop species and eight livestock species. Let's take a look at pesticides, another component of the Green Revolution. These are artificial chemicals that have been developed to kill insects, insecticides, plants, herbicides, and fungi, fungicides. Altogether, they are called pesticides. Many pests evolve resistance to pesticides. Let's take a look at how this can occur. First of all, let's realize that there are a large number of different uh, pesticides that have been developed over the decades since the 1950s and 60s. Here you, see, here you see just a small list. Right now there are over a thousand different um, types of pesticides produced. So here we see just a small list. But one of the very top is Monsanto Roundup. That's a scientific name for it, glyph glyphosate. And its use has doubled since 2001. And largely through the sale of the, and, and use of their Roundup resistant genetically modified crops. So how does this resistance occur? Well, first we have pests attacking the crop. A problem. Pesticide is applied. Solution? For, kills a lot of them, but notice that not all these pests are identical. There are varieties, um, genetic variation uh, within this species. Genetic diversity. So some of them die, but there are some in there that are naturally resistant to the pesticide. So they survive and they flourish. All pests except a few with innate resistance are killed. Survivors breed and produce pesticide resistant population. This is a good example of natural selection. The ones that were naturally resistant um, became selected because the other ones died and now they are a greater percentage of that population. So what do you do? You, you apply the pesticide again. But this time it has little effect, and so you have to develop more toxic chemicals. And this is what we call the pesticide treadmill. You have to keep coming up with new pesticides to kill the insects that have become resistant to the last pesticide that you used. And this is one of the reasons why we've had to develop thousands of pesticides. There's another alternative called biological control. And here we see what kind of bug? Yes, a ladybug destroying a pest. So synthetic chemicals can pollute and be health hazards, and that's the problem with them. Biological control, also called biocontrol, avoids this. It entails battling pests and weeds with other organisms that are natural enemies of those pests and weeds. So the saying is, the enemy of my enemy is my friend, as long as it doesn't become invasive, which it could. Here's another example, Bacillus thuringiensis, also called Bt. It's a soil bacterium that kills many insects from the protein crystals it produces. And we can see these are crystals of the protein, and these can kill bugs that ingest it. Another example is the cactus moth, which was used to wipe out invasive prickly pear cactus in Australia. Here we see this cactus becoming you know, totally invading the space. And then they introduced the moth, which um, destroyed the prickly pear, and so you see it worked in this case. Now, the example would be that that cactus moth perhaps could become invasive if it spread and starts destroying other foliage that is not wanted to get rid of. So we have to use these carefully. This leads us to a, an approach called Integrated Pest Management, IPM, which combines biocontrol, chemical, and other methods, and may include using biocontrol, 
using pesticides, but in smaller doses. Um, doing close population monitoring so that you're only applying what you need. Habitat modification. Perhaps there's um, you know standing water nearby that is create, allowing a breeding ground for, for the pest, so you try to modify that habitat. Crop rotation, you know, you take a year off on a certain crop, and the insects that like that crop are going to die off. Using transgenic crops, that's part of integrated pest management. So these are GM crops that may contain the BT toxin. You could do alternative tillage, so um, maybe not tilling. And of course, mechanical pest removal, physically removing those pests maybe using some kind of a sticky tape or something like that, like we use for house flies. This uh, one example of the success of this approach in Indonesia, and you can see here in the mid 80s, they were having um, a lot of pesticide use. So pesticide production in red, pesticide subsidy, that means the government giving, company, giving money to companies to develop the pesticide at a cheap rate for people to buy. And you can see the amount of milled rice that was being produced. Well, over the next uh, five years, only five years, the um, production declined, the subsidies declined, and the yield increased. So this drop in pesticide subsidy is also a savings of tax dollars. Pollination is an important thing to bring in as we're talking about pesticides. Pollination is the process of plant reproduction, and it's where the male pollen meets the female sex cells. Some plants can self-pollinate where their male parts fertilize the female parts, but some plants require the pollen to go from one plant to another plant. This requires pollinating insects. They're vital for many of our crop plants. They provide an environmental service, a term that you should be aware of. And this we see here is a honeybee pollinating apple blossom. So we need to conserve our pollinators. European, European honeybees are used commercially to pollinate crop plants. They've been hit hard by parasites lately. And the parasites, we're still getting a grasp on this, but we use these bees extensively. We transport them thousands of miles, going um, up, up, up and down wherever the um, current pollinating season is. So we have people over here in California who are beekeepers who will travel up and down the states, um, depending on the season for different um, for different crops. And um, that can be, put a big stress on the bees. They're undergoing a lot of transportation. They're in cramped quarters. And we think that one of the reasons that they're experiencing this is from the stress, that their immune system has been dropped and certain um, mites, some, some kind of parasites, have been affecting their numbers. So we have to be careful of this. The, so coupled with this, the overuse of pesticides can backfire by killing beneficial pollinators. Some of those pesticides could be toxic as well to honeybees. So at the end of your notes, I'd like you to write a summary of the main concepts presented in these slides, and um, we'll go over concepts that you'd like to discuss tomorrow in class.